All right. Today is Sunday, May 14th. This is a recap for the stock market activities last week and an outlook for the week to come. And folks, I got a good one for you tonight. Where do we begin? How about Elon Musk? He just found a new CEO for Twitter. And uh, she happened to be one of the most accomplished, experienced, seasoned, and legendary advertising executives in history. And her name is <laughs> Congressman George Santos in drag. Or it could be... Uh, Former Twitter CEO Agrawal, as a woman this time around, he made a comeback. He got his, her job back. And have you noticed that all of these three people have the same glasses? I don't know, my tinfoil hat is starting to spin now. And speaking of tinfoil hats, how much do you want to bet that Elon was or is banging the CEO, this new CEO, her name is Linda Yakarino. Uh, we know that Elon doesn't like to pull out, so uh, this is gonna be baby mama number, what, 11? You see, the problem with you Tesla culties who keep buying the dip in Tesla with blindfolds on, with no regard to the facts, no regard to the valuations at all, you gotta understand, every penny you invest in Tesla is a gift for Elon Musk, because he needs the cash. He needs to pay for Twitter, he needs to pay for God knows how many baby mamas he got in his bankroll. Just look at the action of Tesla stock this week. Here comes the dip buyers. Okay, we're out of the woods now. The earnings debacle, that's behind us. It's time to buy the dip. You buy the dip, here comes Elon, baby mama money. You buy it again, baby mama money. Another one, baby mama money. Now try to say baby mama money 10 times in a row and let's see how far you're gonna get. But I know she's, uh, she's 59, right? It's kind of impossible to be baby mama at 59, right? But hey, Elon is a great inventor of things. Maybe he's gonna find a solution to that one too. I, I, I have a solution for uh, 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 infertility after menopause. Um, uh, Linda, we need to repopulate the planet um, to, to save civilization. Would you like to try my penis model X? <laughs> And by the way, this uh, Linda Iacarino, she's another uh, WEF kind of tool. So, so much for uh, free speech absolutist, right? There is always a catch. But anyways, what else are we watching? We're watching the elections in Turkey. Um, and I say elections, wink, wink. Because, you know, Erdogan is going to win by 50.99% uh, of the vote. Just in case you invested in those uh, Turkish bonds that was supposed to pay you 300% return. Yeah, good luck with that. But folks, let's get down to business because we have an important item right away. The debt ceiling. This is becoming the number one issue in the stock market right now. Earnings behind us. So what do we have now besides the AI mania? We got the debt ceiling and this is not going pretty good. Although the media keeps saying, oh, everything's okay. Rest assured, it's going to be fine. We're going to work it out. No default. <laughs> Biden is talking to somebody. He doesn't know who that is. But it's certainly not McCarthy. And the Secretary of Treasury, Janet Yellen, she says she's still uncertain about when Treasury will run out of cash. She also added that she needs a different system to end repeated standoffs over U.S. debt ceiling. Wait a minute, I thought this is a democracy and this is how it's supposed to work, right? And maybe the solution to all of this is hold the government to the same standards we are being held to, which is you can't spend beyond your means. If you're going to use the credit card, you got to pay it right away. If I max my credit card, I'm not going to call the laundromat and say, hey, can you please... Uh, uh, increase my debt ceiling just a little bit I want to buy something don't you dare be too political about it doesn't work that way folks and the government has to be held to the same standards you cannot spend beyond your means and you cannot go crazy and tax everybody to death you can't do that either because despite what they say hey folks we're just gonna tax the rich we're not gonna tax anybody who's making less than four hundred thousand dollars that's all bullshit because the recent tax grab that was smaller than 176 billion dollars so we don't have any revenue. And I told you guys before, to solve the problem, they're going to have to raise taxes on everybody. Not just the rich. Not just 400, 400 grand and above. Everybody. Especially the mid-class. And the reason is that's the largest pool of taxpayers. And the problem is $176 billion, that's not going to cut it because the Treasury right now is sitting on $88 billion from the extraordinary measures. We only have $88 billion left. And the magnitude of spending is absolutely stunning. Listen to this. We're talking about the $88 billion now. That is down from around $110 billion a week 
week earlier. So if we do the math, we're spending about $22 billion a week. Anyways, and that means just over a quarter of the $333 billion of authorized measures are still available to keep the U.S. government from running out of borrowing room under the statutory debt limit. And by now, everybody knows that we're supposed to have a meeting on Friday between Biden and McCarthy, and that was delayed for whatever reason. And this is supposed to be bad news. They were supposed to meet on Friday. We got two weeks left now. But somehow, the media is spinning this into something good. Oh, there is progress because the staff is talking to each other. Oh, really? And then Biden comes out and says the U.S. debt ceiling talks are moving along. Moving along where? Off a cliff? Because according to McCarthy, he says that Biden is not interested in a deal at all. He's not even going to talk to him. But Biden says, no, everything is okay. Rest assured. Stay calm. I think they're moving along. Hard to tell. We have not reached the crunch point yet. Biden told reporters, what are you talking about? Crunch point? We got two weeks left, buddy. We'll know more in the next two days. So we'll see. Now they say, oh, we're gonna, they're going to meet on Tuesday. A reminder, we are now at the first stage of this negotiation, which is the two men, Biden and McCarthy, holding to their guns. One of these two will capitulate. And I highly recommend that you watch the Frontline documentary about the 2011 debt ceiling negotiations. It is called Cliffhanger. You see, back then, both Obama and Boehner, they had their differences in politics, but they got along. There was great chemistry between the two. They drank beer together. They did videos together. They drank wine together. Walking around the White House with sunglasses. They watched movies together. And of course, Boehner, like a little bitch, cries every five minutes. No wonder why the stock market crashed by 20%, but somehow the stock of Kimberly Clark actually shot up higher. With all of that Kleenex that the taxpayer bought for, for Boehner to wipe his tears. And God knows what else. And these two guys, they played golf together. It was great chemistry between the two. So we knew, sure, they might have their differences. It might get ugly. But at the end of the day, are they really going to default the country? Are they really going to go to the last minute? And they did. And the stock market went down by over 20%. And the problem this time around is we have zero chemistry between Biden and McCarthy. Matter of fact, nobody has any chemistry with Joe Biden because nobody's allowed to meet Joe. Because the handlers, they, they hide Joey B. They keep him on a tight schedule like a patient, elderly patient. Mr. President, time to wake up. Time to eat your jello. Okay, time for a nap. Time to go to bed. And you see that evident in the conferences every time he asks, right? Am, am I allowed to do this, Jack? I don't, I don't know. They're not going to get mad at me, Jack. I'm like, dude, you're the president. You call the shots, not the handlers. And the problem on the Republican side is, see, Bain or Obama, they had great chemistry. They would have done a deal right away. But Bain or Balls was held by the Tea Party. That was an outside element. So sure, after ugly negotiations, we got, what, what was it called? The Budget Reduction Act of 2011 which was bullshit, by the way. It did not reduce shit. It was basically Boehner capitulating to Obama. And he sold the fantasy to the Tea Party and uh, his Republican Party. All what they got for sure, all what the Republican Party was interested in from the Budget Reduction Act is the tax cuts, baby. The tax cuts for the rich. And they got that. And once they got that, they did not give a shit whether there is a budget reduction or not. In reality, the difference this time around is McCarthy's balls are being held not by an outside party, but by the so-called MAGA Republicans within the Republican Party. And I think that's a major, major difference, meaning that McCarthy cannot capitulate at any cost, which means will Biden capitulate after all of these promises about student loan forgiveness? All of that bullshit, he's just going to abandon all of that? So when I hear the talking heads on TV saying, oh, this is going to be a, another episode, they're going to come to a deal, we're not going to default, blah, blah, blah. I hope that's the case. I hope we're going to wake up on Monday, boom, we got a deal. But realistically, looking at the situation, it doesn't look good. And there is a, there's a threshold, there's a time limit, there's a date where the market is going to start to panic. That could be Tuesday, that could be this Friday, who knows. But we're getting closer. And if we don't have a deal this week, by Tuesday, the market is going to start to panic. And guess who's going to be the casualty? Where the money's going to come out of? It's going to come out of the winners year to date, a.k.a. the big caps. And if the big caps sell off, the indices will go down with them. The reason we have a rally year to date is the big caps. If the big caps go down, down goes the market. End of the story. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is the macro data. And I say, folks, be careful of an icy hot market. Be careful of an icy hot economy. What am I talking about? You see, I get a lot of comments 
from our beloved viewers. I love all of them. But they keep saying, oh, it has been a tough year for the bears. Oh my God, we're missing out. The stock market is in a bull rally. I'm like, what are you people on? Seriously, like what, what kind of drugs are you on? I'd like to have some of that. The so-called rally is concentrated in a handful of names. The AI mania, the big caps, that's it. That's the hot. Then you got the icy part, which is the rest of the market. Be it banks, be it metals, be it oil, be it a lot of industrials, be it a lot of cyclicals, all down big time year to date. When we look at the economy, it's the same thing. We have data that points out to inflationary factors in the economy going on. Then we have other pieces of data pointing out for a recession, hence the IC hot economy. When was the last time we've seen an IC hot economy? And this is a question, of course, to the old timers. You know, the dinosaurs who've been trading the stock market for a long, long time. And by a long time and by dinosaurs, I mean uh, 2007, 2008, because it seems like everybody was in their diapers back in 2007, 2008. Even the people who are 50 years old right now, nobody seems to remember at all. But back in 07, 08, we would get pieces of data that point out for, oh my God, the housing market is crashing. And then we get other pieces of data pointing out for inflation, more inflation in the economy. Hence the icy hot economy. And we now know how that one ended. So let's look at the data that we got this week so far. And let's categorize them inflationary, deflationary, recessionary. And where is this piece of data moving from to? If you look at the CPI, for example, it came out of 4.9. That's the headline reading versus 5. And this is what the bulls were hanging their hats on. The bears were looking at single categories, such as used cars, such as energy commodities, which all moved higher month over month from declines. And therefore, I said, you know, the CPI offers points to the bulls, points to the bears. No wonder why the market didn't really get too excited about the CPI. But all in all, if you believe the headline reading, the CPI is still moving from inflation into deflation. Is it exactly at deflation right now? Of course not, because we have these individual categories that continue to rebound easily out of nowhere. So for now, we're heading into deflation, but we're not exactly at deflation. But it is a different story when it comes to the PPI. The PPI is almost at 2%, and it is moving from deflation into recession. You might have noticed that the market did not really like the PPI, even though we thought that, hey, if we get any rating at 2%, the bulls should love that. The market should rally. But it was a massive decline month over month. The headline rating was a massive decline from last month. And that kind of revived the recession fears that, oh my God, the PPI is crashing because we're heading into a recession. So the PPI moves from deflation closer to a recession. It is still a deflation, I would argue. But the magnitude of the decline is really alarming. When we look at jobless claims, here's the headline. Jobless claims hit 264,000 in the latest week, highest level since October 21. And the claims were up by 22,000 versus the 3,000 expected. So it's a massive beat. And again, the market did not like this one. Why? Because it's moving from inflation rapidly into a recession. And to me, this is the most alarming piece of data. What if the employment market is not as good as we're being told? What if we see massive deterioration in the employment market rapidly? Because a reminder, the cure for inflation guaranteed 1 million percent is unemployment. Once you see the unemployment rate moving higher, no need for rate hikes. The unemployment rate will do the job and kill inflation because it destroys the aggregate demand in the economy. But for jobless claims to move rapidly from inflation, and I would argue past deflation into the recessionary territory is really alarming. Then we look at import prices that we got on Friday, and I believe this was really upsetting to the stock market because it pushed the dollar significantly higher in a single day. Here's the headline, or here's the, the reading for import prices. Notice they've been going down month after month after month. This is the first positive reading this year so far. Now I've been saying, folks, be careful. Be careful what you wish for. If you say, oh, China reopening, that's good for the stock market. China reopening, that's good for the economy. China reopening, if it is true, it means more inflation. It means higher import prices. And it looks like these readings that we have right now are bottoming and they're about to move to positive territory again. And hence, import prices moving from, I would argue, closer to a recession reading all the way back to inflation. And that's a rapid move. And the market doesn't like these kind of rapid moves from one reading to the other. 
be it jobless claims or import prices. Now, if we look at consumer sentiment from uh, the University of Michigan this Friday, here's the reading. It says the consumer sentiment tumbles to six month low in May on renewed fears about the US economy. So again, this is moving from deflation into recession. Not a good reading, but here's the catch. And perhaps the best illustration for the icy hot economy. Within the U of M report that we got that includes consumer sentiment, we also have inflation expectations. Here it is. Americans view a near-term inflation moderated slightly in May. They now expect the inflation rate in the next year to average about 4.5%. Now, that's way above the Fed's target of 2%. Inflation expectations had surged to 4.6% in April from 36 in March. Here's the problem. Inflation expectations over the next five years rose... Uh-oh, to 3.2% from 3% in April. That is the highest reading since 2011. Sound the alarm, folks. And it's not just here. Look at the ECB's data. Inflation expectations in the next two months, excuse me, over the next 12 months and the three years ahead across the Atlantic also moving higher. And here it is, inflation expectations moving from deflation to inflation also at a rapid scale. So what do we do with this economy? You got certain pieces of data pointing out to a recession, others pointing out to reinflation, others moving back to deflation, but there is no guarantee they're going to stop at deflation. You see, the Fed wants to move everything from inflation all the way to deflation without overdoing it. I'm pushing these readings all the way to recession, but there is no guarantee, there is no formula, there is no a fine tune, a surgical approach that guarantees we're going to go to deflation exactly. Most likely, they have to overdo it and get us into a recession. That's why it's really hard for central banks to come bad inflation. But the most problematic of all of this is that we have certain readings moving back into inflation, which will make the Fed's job even harder. No wonder why on Friday, when we look at the Fed rate hike expectations for the June meeting, for now the consensus remains no hike and a pause. But this probability is actually moving down. The probability of another 25 basis points gained a lot of steam on Friday. And this is really the problem for the stock market. It means that the Fed really cannot pause in the June meeting giving this data. But the more they do, the more damage the economy will have to endure. And the end result will be higher unemployment, which will take care of inflation. And that's that. We get a recession. Or the Fed will continue to hike rates, and then something big will blow up, and they will have to abruptly cut rates. And that will cause a lot of panic, just like we saw back in 08, 09. The stock market will crash. The economy will head into a severe recession because credit tightening will gain even more steam than it is already gaining right now in the economy. So either way, we have a shitty choice. Either we eat a recession back from higher unemployment right away, or we're going to blow up something big and then we have a systemic crash. Of course, the bullish argument goes, oh, but rest assured, the Fed who told us that inflation is transitory, oh, they're going to fine tune it exactly to land the plane at deflation and avoid a recession. And I say, give me a break. Really? And now comes what happens after the crash. Will it be a V-shaped recovery just like we got back in 09? The Fed eases and boom, we get a bunch of bailouts and in no time the stock market recovers. Or is it going to be more of the aftermath of the dot-com where the market stagnates for years? Or the worst case scenario, will it be a lost decade? This is what we're going to study right now. We will look at the Nikkei Japan. This is a monthly chart. You can see that this market never recovered. It topped back in the late 80s after a massive mania, huge bubble. Ask any old timers who went to Tokyo back in the 80s. It was an insane orgy, the biggest party the planet has ever seen. But all of that came down crashing and comes the lost decade or decades in the case of Japan. It didn't matter how much easing the BOJ did. It didn't matter how long they kept interest rates at zero or negative. The stock market never recovered. And when we zoom in to that particular case of the Nikkei, you can see massive rally. It got a few crashes along the way, but it finally stopped at the late 80s and that was the big crash and then of course just like any crash after an insane mania we get these bear market rallies and the reason is short covering these are the mechanical reasons but the psychological reasons is the conditioning the recency bias the stock market goes by a little bit you have a lot of folks waiting on the sidelines they say oh i missed the rally now it's down 10 20 percent this is my time to get in a lot of folks who want the average down they buy the dip and they get slaughtered right away because the memo should have been passed hey folks 
it's over. It's done. In the meantime, these bear market rallies are huge. And we get the delusion of some people thinking that this is indeed the bottom and we have a bull market rally coming. Look at the bear market rally in uh, the Nikkei 91. It produced over 37% worth of gains. And then what? It topped and it moved down and the stock market never recovered. Here's the S&P 500, a monthly chart. Look at this, massive mania. It ended in 22. We got the first leg of the crash and now we have a big bear market rally. And this rally is worth about, let's say 20% since the bottom. And folks say, oh, but this is the beginning of a new bull market rally. What are you talking about, buddy? Look at the Nikkei. It rallied over 35% and it crashed anyways. You can't say that this is the beginning of a bull market when there is not a single solid indicator pointing out to that outcome. The question becomes, is this the beginning of our lost decade? We get a bear market rally worth 20, 25% and the S&P crashes, it goes down and stays there for years and years to come. That is the worst case scenario. How do we get to a lost decade? We'll talk about that in a minute, but we have many examples in different markets because the psychology remains the same, regardless of the market, regardless of the culture. For example, the Shanghai Chinese stock market, massive mania in the mid 2000s. The Shanghai index rallied by over 500%. Then came the crash and it never recovered. It is a lost decade and then some. Now put yourself in the shoes of those who were buying the rally as the Shanghai market was exploding higher. If somebody told you, hey, this is a mania, it's going to crash, we're going to have a lost decade and then some, what would you have said? You would have said, oh, you're out of your mind, you're a perm perma bear, you're doom and gloom. This is a bull market rally, but this is a mania. This is not a real rally. And mania phases in the stock market almost always end in periods of stagnation that last for years, in most cases more than a decade. So you would argue that the lost decade could actually be pretty good if we actually have it exactly at a decade, but it could prolong more than a decade. Look at the Saudi stock market, for example, along with the Shanghai market in the mid 2000s, massive rally worth about over 700%. The stock market of Saudi Arabia never really recovered since then after the crash. Now go to Saudi and ask anybody became a millionaire in that boom without catching the bust. Anybody got out of the top, you're not going to find too many stories, but you're going to find plenty of stories of bag holders, of life savings, have been wasted. People who bought the mania and they got crushed. Same goes in the Shanghai market. A lot of people never recovered their money. And why go to Japan, China, Saudi? Why not we stick to the American stock market, the Nasdaq? After a mania rally known as the dot-com bubble, guess what? The Nasdaq crashed and it never recovered that top for about 16 years. More than a lost decade. Again, look at the cues right now. What we got in 2020 was a mania rally, fueled by stimmies, fueled by an orgy of speculation. You think we're done by this little dip down and uh, we bottomed and this is the new bull market? I hope you're right, but if you're not, you got another thing coming to you. But at the end of the day, why do we have a lost decade maverick? What is the psychological reason behind a lost decade? The answer is trauma. What am I talking about? You know, I've been reading a lot of uh, business news over the weekend and I stumbled into this. It says Austin Russell acquires majority stake in Forbes magazine. Now, Austin Russell is the CEO of Luminar. And again, I'm a fan of the company. I'm a fan of Austin Russell. I think he's a nice guy in real life, but I got to be careful of kissing his ass too much because I think I said in a prior episode that uh, I think that Sam bankrupt fraud is a nice guy. And look at how that played out. So for all you know, Austin Russell could be a scam artist. I don't know. I'm just saying from what I hear, he's a nice guy. But Luminar is a profitless company. So how the hell did Austin Russell buy Forbes magazine? How did he buy all of these big mansions worth over $80 million? How did he become a billionaire when the company is profitless? How come he, Austin Russell, is worth more than the company he founded? I'll tell you why. He used the retail mom and pop mania chasing anything, EV mania, SPAC mania, LADAR mania, tulip mania, all kind of manias that the mom and pop crowd gets indulged in. Now it's the AI mania, which is by the way going to end the same way as we've seen the EV mania, for example, but it doesn't matter. The mom and pops, they pour their hard earned money, their savings, their retirements, and they chase these manias, believing that this is going to be the next Amazon, the next Netflix, the next uh, Facebook the next Microsoft. And uh, in reality, it ends up being the next jerk off. If you bought Luminar at the IPO, you're down about 50%. 
If you bought at the top, you're down over 88%. But CEO Austin Russell, he doesn't give a shit about Ladar or Luminar. It's a pump and dump, baby. Whether the company makes it or not, who gives a shit? You IPO the company, you pimp it a little bit, you sell it to the mom and pops, they stampede, they push the valuations beyond imaginations, you click the sell button, also known as the cha-ching button, and you cash out. Boom, you're set for life. And this is what Austin Russell did. He sold, what, a quarter of a million dollars? in cash and he used the money to buy all of these mansions classic cars and forbes magazine and the mom and pops hold the bank and now austin russell is buying back his stock at a cheaper price he sold at the top and buying at the bottom the mom and pops they buy at the top they sell at the bottom because they chase these manias the problem is what if we have a lost decade what if these things never recover and that leads us to why we see the phenomenon of lost decades. The mom and pop investors become really traumatized. They don't believe in the stock market anymore. Every time they get engaged in the stock market, it ends up in, in tragedy. They end up holding the back, chasing every promise that doesn't materialize. At some point, they give up. It doesn't matter how cheap the stock market is. And in the case of Japan, for example, a lot of people got traumatized by debt. Say debt to any Japanese person right now. It scares them more than Godzilla. I remember a Japanese roommate that I used to live with back in the day. He was a little older than me. And one day we're going out. And I would say, hey man, you want to join us? We're going to go to a bar, have a few beers. And he says, oh no thanks. You guys go ahead and enjoy. I've already spent my going out budget. I'm like, what are you talking about, dude? I'll spot you. I'll buy you a beer. No problem. Come come with us. He's like, no, 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 no. I have money. I'm just done with my going out budget. And I'm like, what the f*** are you talking about? What is a going out budget? What are you talking about? Anyways, we leave, but I kept thinking about this. What is this man talking about? And then I came back to him and said, hey, what is this budgeting all about? He says, oh, in Japan, we have a budget. And every month they have a budget for food, for going out, for supplies, for savings, etc., etc. And I cannot go over budget. I don't believe in debt. I don't use credit cards. And that was one of the first financial lessons in my life. I found a guy who actually knows how to budget. I did not know what a budget is. I thought you just go to the bar and you, you keep buying drinks until you drop. And then you worry about the bill later on. Just swipe those credit cards up and down, up and down, up and down, who cares? But it turns out the Japanese do. And if you have this kind of trauma in a society, in a generation, be it millennials, be it Gen Zers, when they've been living on debt for years, and then they get annihilated because the Fed raised rates so much, broke the economy, and a lot of them have to file for bankruptcy. They have to see their holdings their property, being foreclosed, being repossessed. All of this is trauma. And you think never again. No more debt, no more living beyond my means. This kind of frugal behavior by the consumer causes the lost decade. And then it becomes entrenched into the economy, into the psychology of the consumer. It's really hard to break. And that's what's going on in Japan right now. With that being said, does that mean you just have to give up as an investor and say, okay, we're going to have a lost decade, Maverick? Who cares about the stock market anymore? I'm out. The answer is no, because while we might have a lost decade here in the US, other markets will be booming. Opportunities will appear in other markets. I don't know where exactly. I wish I could, but I'm not a psychic. If you look at other charts, I mean, I showed you what the NASDAQ and the SPX charts look like. They don't look good at all. And then you look at the Indian stock market, for example, known as the Sensex. It is certainly a much better looking chart than the SPX and the Qs. Is it going to stay this way? I have no idea. We could have a global crash and the Indian stock market goes down too. Then you look at the Japanese case, the Nikkei. This is a monthly chart. It is certainly much better than the S&P or the Nasdaq. It is actually breaking out, believe it or not. And it could be the case that we might have a lost decade here, but somehow Japan recovers. And therefore I say there is always, always... A bull market somewhere, somehow. There was always an investment opportunity. But it might not be here, folks. We might have to accept that reality. That the boom in the US market is over. Or we might stagnate for years. Maybe it's not a decade. Maybe it's five years. Maybe it's more than a decade. We have no idea. But that doesn't mean that opportunities will not appear elsewhere. And that's the message of the day. And with that, folks, let's move on to cover the stock market information for you. We begin with the closing of the indices today. Excuse me. On Friday... And uh, here we go. On Friday, the Dow Industrial Average was down by 8.89 points or a decline of 0.03%. The Nasdaq negative by 43.76 points or a decline of 0.35%. The S&P also down by 6.54 points or a decline of 0.16%. Now markets were down big and then came the end of the day rally as we've been seeing uh, lately. Why do we see this phenomenon? The answer is the shorts. They shorten the morning, they cover by the end of the day. This is what's keeping the market right now 
now intact. The shorts. Without the shorts, the Dow would have closed the day down by 300, 400 points. So Jamie Demon says, oh, we gotta ban the shorts. As a stock market bear, I say, please, do it. Anyways, the sector's performances on Friday. Number one, capturing the gold medal, utilities. Number two for the silver, energy. Number three for the bronze, materials. And the laggard for the day was consumer cyclicals, aka Amazon and Tesla. We compare this with the weekly performance. What do we see here? Pathetic performance across the board. Barely anything positive with the exception of communication services, aka Google. Without Google, the market should have been down big. So again, is this really a bull market that's being held by one big cap at a time? Not really. The laggards for the week, led by materials, energy, and financials. Nothing worked this week, and metals got hit really, really hard. And the reason is, earlier in the week, we got some um, recessionary data, and then later in the week, we got some inflationary data. And if you're on my Discord, in the morning brief on Friday, I said, look, this import price index and the rise in the dollar, while it could be negative for commodities, I don't really think so. You might see the phenomenon of the dollar moving higher along with commodities. Why? Because if the dollar is moving higher, then we have inflation in the economy and more expectations of Fed tightening. If that is the case, then maybe commodities are being punished with no justifications, with the assumption that we are in a recession right now when we're really not. We're not done with the inflation episode. And there is an arbitrage when they punish uh, steel stocks, for example, copper stocks, fertilizer stocks, energy stocks, because we have, oh my God, a recession is coming. And then we get a piece of data saying, uh, 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 not so fast, we still have an inflation problem. Then the arbitrage is in buying the dip in these names, the steel names, the resources, energy, metals, fertilizers. But again, you gotta be really quick in booking your profits. And the reason is you're gonna get another piece of data that points out for a recession. We're gonna see them being sold off. And then comes another piece of data pointing out for more inflation. And hence the icy hot economy. It's really hard to invest and trade in an icy hot market. What about the breadth on Friday? NYSE 41% advancing versus 56% declining. The NASDAQ on the other hand, 39% advancing versus 57% declining. We closed pretty much on the neutral line, slightly negative, which means we have more room to the downside if the market wants to go further down. Anyhow, moving on to commodities, the dollar was up over half a percentage point on Friday, so no wonder why we see declines across the board. Whether we're talking about energy commodities, whether we're talking about metals, platinum, palladium, even in softs, lumber was down, in grains, soybean oil was down over 4% in a single day. Then you look at the Japanese yen, down about 1% for the day. What does that say? Believe it or not, it's actually an inflationary theme. The dollar pops higher, the prices of commodities go down because there is an algorithmic reaction. The computers don't really think. The robots look at the dollar up and they say, oh, now I got to sell all of these commodities, energy, metals, grains, doesn't matter. But the human in the stock market looks at the data and says, wait a minute here. Import prices are moving back to positive territory. Inflation expectations are moving higher. And hence, the Fed is not done. So the dollar moves higher. And with that, you got to buy the dip in energy, metals, resources, the names that are getting punished because of the recession theme. I don't know if this is clear or not, folks. Is it really that confusing? Please leave comments and let me know. What you see right now in the map is an algorithmic reaction to what's going on in the dollar. The dollar ticks higher, commodities go down. But the dollar is moving higher for what? More Fed rate hike expectations. Why is that happening? Because we have more inflationary data. And hence the arbitrage opportunity, not in the commodity, but in the stocks of these commodities. I hope that's clear. And then we have two other commodities that actually managed to close in the green. One being natural gas up about 4% on Friday alone. And the reason is the rate counts collapsed. I made a video over the weekend for the members. I talked about how the rate counts are going down. And now that we're heading into the summer season where the demand for natural gas is going to go higher because of the heat, the producers are saying, okay, shorts, You've been punishing natural gas aggressively. You're betting for a recession, but you're getting a little nervous, aren't you? Because we're heading into the summer season and more demand coming. But you're so confident that natural gas prices will be down because whatever increase in demand we're going to see, it's not going to meet the insane supply that's going on right now in the storage. Okay, now watch this. We're going to drop the rate counts dramatically ahead of the increase of the demand. And hence now we're going to push supply to meet demand. And perhaps demand will surpass supply. And if that is the case, then for sure we have the bottom in natural gas. And we're about to see a massive short squeeze coming. We'll see what happens. 
But we also have wheat. Wheat was up on Friday, and the reason is we got the news that farmers are now abandoning wheat crops at the highest rate since 1917. The weather was bad. You cannot really recover these crops after massive droughts. You have to, to switch the crops to corn. So my hunch is we're going to have more corn or soybeans, those prices should go down because supply will increase, but then wheat should recover because we're going to have more demand, less supply. If wheat is not coming out of Ukraine, if wheat is not being planted in, in the U.S. anymore, we got a massive problem here, folks. You haven't seen a damn thing yet. Moving on to the options market, aka the big casino, what do we see here on Friday? The hottest table by far, once again, Tesla. Although the volume all in all was down, a lot of folks did not want to take a lot of risk using options on Friday. The majority of the action was led by zero date till expiration options and of course the shorts. But regardless, Tesla was the hottest table by far, an increase in volume, 4.4 million contracts traded on Friday alone. About 64% of those were calls, betting that Elon now is going to go back to Tesla and that's going to solve the problem. It's not, folks. Tesla has more problems than Elon. And whatever buying you're doing right now, any dip you're buying, guess who's dumping? I made a joke it's Elon because of the baby mama money, but it's the holders. If you're giving the holders a better price, oh, they're going to take it. Because a lot of them are now convinced that, look, Tesla has a lot of problems. It's a maturing company now. The input prices, the margins, the competition. I made a lot of money in Tesla. I want to get at a better price than it's traded at right now. If you pump the stock, I'm dumping. I'm taking my money for another opportunity. And that's what's going on, folks. Anyhow, Apple at number two with around 900,000 contracts traded on Friday. About 55% of those were calls. Alphabet, a.k.a. Google, at number three with around 850,000 contracts traded on Friday. About 69% of those were calls. We still have a gamma squeeze going on in Alphabet. Be careful shorting that one because they're buying options with uh, longer expiration dates out of the money. They want to force that short squeeze all the way till the end. But then you have gamma squeezes that are frizzling out in Amazon, for example, in NVIDIA. Anyhow, let's move on to the unusual activities that took place in the options market on Friday. We start with the ticker H-E-L-E -E for the Helen of Troy. The name crashed since the top, big time, never really recovered, and somebody's betting for more pain to come. They bought the 85 puts for the expiration date, June 16, with expectations that H-E-L-E -E will go down and lose more than 13% of its value by then. They paid about two and a half bucks a piece, standard of this trade, all in all, spending around $1.7 million. And then we have a trade for the Qs, a bearish one. It could be a hedge too, but somebody bought the 308 puts for the expiration date, July 21st, with the expectations that the queues could go down and lose more than 5% of its value by then. They paid about 5 bucks and 35 cents a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $3.4 million. And then we got the ticker POOL for Pool Corporation. Now the name is up year to date, but it's losing a lot of momentum, and somebody's betting for more declines to come. They bought the 300 puts for the expiration date, June 16, with expectations that the name will go down and lose more than 11.5% of its value by then. They paid about 4 bucks a piece to this trade all in all spending around two million dollars and here it is ulta alta beauty a lot of you have been asking over and over and over again when when do we short alta maverick the business is good but maybe it is time because somebody bought the 450 puts for the expiration date june 16 with the expectations that the name will go down and lose more than 12 and a half percent of its value by then they paid about four bucks and 60 cents a piece tenor this trade all in all spending around two and a half million dollars on to the heat map on friday what do we see here just like i told you we should see a rebound in the resources be it steel be it copper be it oil of course, the absence was from fertilizers, mosaic, nutrient, those are down big. But it could be an opportunity depending on whether wheat is going to recover or not. And most importantly, if you believe that nat gas prices are going to bottom, this could be yet another catalyst for these names to rebound higher. I'm keeping an eye. I have some call options, but I'm not too optimistic to be honest with you. In any case, it was a flannish day across the board. The cyclicals were down. We saw some of the max pain being played out in Amazon, for example, in Tesla. It played out. Tesla was down. We'll talk about news about Tesla in a minute. But a lot of the max pain did play out, be it in Meta, be it in Apple, be it in some of the financials. And of course, the consistent ad performers happen to be in Staples. These names are holding pretty good. Sure, you can see one name down big once in a while. They blow up earnings. But for the most part, the most reliable Staples 
are still holding pretty good. They're still, believe it or not, in a bull market. If you look at all of these sectors charts, there are only two charts that are still in a bull market. One of them is Staples. But again, you look at this map, the breadth, believe it or not, absence of the big caps, the breadth was a lot better than previous days. We see a lot of names in healthcare holding up, a lot of names in industrials holding up, a lot of names in utilities, in materials, in energy in staples, even in regional banks, and some of the technology companies moving higher. But just because one or two big caps did not outperform, Amazon down a little bit, so is Tesla, Meta, Apple, that was enough to close the Nasdaq negative. And that's the sheer weighting of these big caps. If they start to fall, the indices will go down. Even if we have a healthy market overall, with healthcare outperforming, with banks performing, with energy, materials, utilities, staples, just because of these big caps are down, the indices will go down. But what do we have so far this year? We have the opposite picture. Every other sector is not doing pretty good, but the big caps are doing good, and hence we have what people are now calling a bull market rally. Anyhow, when we contrast this with the weekly heat map, look at this. Not looking good. Banks are down, healthcare down industrials down, real estate down, energy, materials, staples, cyclicals, the telecom names, the media names, all down for the week. Even chips are down, with the exception of AMD. But just because you got two names, Amazon and Google, performing, that was enough for the indices to close positive. This is not how bull markets are made. Bull markets require participation by most names, not just two or three. Now let's talk about Tesla because yes, we got what people are perceiving as good news that Elon is done with Twitter and he has more time to allocate for Tesla and that should be a good thing. Then we got hit with bad news. We start with the good ones. Tesla raising prices again in the Model 3 and Tesla's playing a lot of games. Cutting prices, raising prices and they can afford to play with the pricing because they have the margin advantage versus GM versus Ford. So the company can't afford to experiment until they find the sweet spot, unlike the others. But this is also bad for the investors, because all of this experimenting is causing volatility. And if they screw up, it could impact the stock negatively. But for now, you think Tesla management really cares about what the stock is doing? No. They look at the numbers, the margins, the financials, and they want to get it right, regardless if this causes pain in the short run in Tesla stock. So you gotta be careful buying the dip here. And then we got the bad news. Tesla owners are now suing, saying the software updates cut the range by 20% and it broke batteries. And perhaps the devastating news that Tesla's recalling almost every car it has ever sold in China. And I know the cultists would say, hey Maverick, this is not really a recall. It's done via software. I'm not sure that that's the case in China though. In any case, a recall is a recall, whether you're doing it via software or you're doing it mechanically. At the end of the day, every EV is going to have recalls done via software, but a recall is a recall. And they're not just recalling one car or one model, they're recalling almost every car they've ever sold in China. The weight of the headline alone is negative. And hence, we got yet another failed opportunity to rally in Tesla on Friday. It was a gap and crap. We'll look at the weekly heat map for the ETFs again, not looking good. Most ETFs were in the red. And we're talking deep in the red in the cases of the KRE, the regional banks. In the case of gold miners, the GDX, the SLV silver. So for all of those people who say, oh, it's a recession theme, you gotta buy gold and silver. This week, it was not a recession theme. Maybe it was a stagflation theme because nothing had performed this week. You got the utilities flattish, you got the staples flattish, the biotech flattish, but that's being tilted and manipulated by one or two names. The weight loss mania, NVO, Eli Lilly, it has been outperforming for now, but my hunch is that's not going to last. Then you look at the growth large caps. Those actually closed positive for the week. Thank you once again to Google and Amazon. So for everybody who tells me, hey, this is a bull market, look at this heat map every single day. Look at it from weekly perspective every single week. And you will find out that a lot of these rallies in the indices, the SPY, the Qs, are happening based on a handful of names. That's all there is. Of course, the winner of the week is Nat Gas. UNG up about 7.5% for the week. Boil, B-O-I-L, up about 13% for the week. Let's do some charts and then wrap it up when we begin with the SPY, the S&P 500, 30 minutes chart. What do we see here? Had we closed below 410, we got a break of some sort, but we did not. So we closed within range. Support 410, resistance 413.56. But what's really important is we actually got a gap higher in the morning. And it stopped pretty much exactly at 413.56. So what does that say? It says, hey chart, you need to bring me something else. 
Give me something new, maybe a debt ceiling deal, something, so I can grant you permission above 413.56. And if we don't get that piece of evidence, then the break will happen to the downside. We're going to lose 410 of support. When we look at the daily chart for the continuous contract for the E-mini futures for the S&P, what do we see here? Within range, 4100 support, 4180 as resistance. We've been saying this for weeks now, with no conclusive break one way or the other. You look at the RSI, it is in negative divergence. You look at the MACD indicator, it is in negative momentum, but we don't have a break. So what do you do right now? You do what we've been doing so far for about a month or so, day trading. We buy, hold for a little bit, few options here and there, make 15%, 25%, 35%, and move on. And of course, you shouldn't be gambling your entire account in options. That's insanity. Your options account should be, I don't know, 10 to 25% of your total portfolio max, depending on your age. But a lot of you go all in. The entire portfolio, buying weekly calls or puts, that's insanity. Especially in a flattish market with no break one way or the other. For now, it's a day trading market. There's nothing we can do. We look at the daily chart for the SPX, the cash index again. Negative divergence on the RSI, negative readings on the MACD indicator, all pointing out for bearish momentum. We have yet another closing above 4100. The line in the sand is being defended once again. We zoom in to let's say a 30 minutes chart look at what happened every time we get down to 4100 we have a buyer and the buyer is the market maker what is the message here the market maker says i have not seen a piece of evidence that i should break 4100 as support hey bears show me something more the bulls did not show me anything right now for me to go all the way to 40 4200 would the bears show me something to break 4100 a support that would be considered a break if we have a closing below 4100 especially on weekly basis and then he got your break we look at the weekly chart for the spx look at this higher lows higher highs for now but it is a wedge pattern which is not really that bullish but we can see the rsi and the macd indicators and the monthly kind of losing momentum here so a weekly closing below 4100 but most importantly a weekly closing below 4000 will indicate that the wedge will likely be broken to the downside and make a lower low and that will change the entire game altogether. for now the bullish theory is still alive we look at the cues and hourly chart what do we see here we got a gap and crap and the chart lost the number that we talked about before 323.63 but then came the shorts covering by the end of the day and they closed above it any conclusion right now of course not but technically we are in a breakout because this is the last resistance the problem is are you going to believe it are you going to buy it or not the market is saying hey i'm ready to go but folks are not buying it nobody wants to believe that this is real and if it's not then what we got in the last two hours on friday could be a b leg in a reverse a b c formation which could take us all the way down to 321 and a half comes monday but here's the daily chart for the continuous contract for the nasdaq and unlike the SPY, we do have a breakout here. On weekly basis, the NASDAQ futures closed above 13,300. That's a breakout. Sure, the RSI is still in negative divergence. The MACD is in positive momentum, but not really decisive. It could lose that any day now. But we did get a retest of 13,300, and the test held for now. Can you look at this and say this is a bearish behavior? Of course not. It is a bullish behavior. So we look at the NDX, the big NASDAQ, a weekly chart. What do we see here? The danger becomes if this is yet another bear market rally and we're just consolidating in a wedge pattern, which will be broken to the downside. We know what the upside is. The upside is we go all the way to the August highs from last year, and that would be a gain of about 3% from this point on. The bearish outlook says, watch out, this is yet another wedge pattern. We've seen those before, and they always break to the downside. And the warning sign, if we have any leading indicator here, would be the SMH, the CHIPS index. Now, you would think that CHIPS should be traded hand-in-hand -hand with the NDX, the NASDAQ technology. Not recently, though. SMH in white, the Q's in orange. You can see the recent divergence. SMH is actually trending down, the NASDAQ trending high. One of these two is lying. Either the NASDAQ is lying, it should be going down, or the SMH is just catching maybe a bad week or two, and then it's going to catch up with the Qs and move higher. Which one do you think is lying? Let us know in the comments. I think you know what my stance is. I think chips is the leading indicator. And if chips are sick, this is not a good look for the NASDAQ. And it's not just chips, by the way, that is sending the signal. It's also copper. We talked about this in the previous video. When we look at the IWM, an hourly chart, what do we see here? We got an attempt 
at cracking above 174.22. That did not work out. And we closed pretty much at the lows of the day. A little bit of short covering at the end. Closed flattish. Can we do anything here? Of course not. We break above. 174.22 we buy other than that the assumption should be the iwm will close the gap that is below not above and maybe we have yet another retest at 168.90 now the iwm the monthly chart is the most important chart you should be looking at if you do believe that the iwm the russell 2000 is a leading indicator then do yourself a favor look at the macd and the rsi on the Qs and the s p it looks that the RSI is kind of stalling and it looks that the MACD is supposed to cross producing positive impressions in the histogram indicating bullish momentum but we're not there yet if you believe that the Russell is the leading indicator look at what the Russell is doing right now the RSI is weakening the MACD is actually curling back down and the ultimate confirmation would be breaking the support 167 and a half if we have a closing below this line, it's over. Russell is going to crash with it, the SPY and the Qs too. And again, this could be a reverse ABC pattern formation. So the bulls must defend 167 and a half. They must move the IWM higher from this point on. Well, the IWM depends on regional banks. Regional banks are not doing pretty good. If we have inflationary data that will push the Fed to do another 25, you really think these regional banks are going to hold with deposits fleeing? Of course not. Here's the dollar, the Dixie and hourly chart. What do we see here? Excuse me, a four hours chart. What do we see here? We got the breakout above 102, but it is getting overbought right now. The algos will be triggered if we have a closing above 103. If the dollar makes it above 103, you're going to see chaos in the stock market, in the S&P and the Qs. They will sell off, no doubt about it, because this indicates that the Fed will have to do more. And of course, folks are buying the dollar right now because of all of this debt ceiling. They're buying the dollar as a hedge. If that is the case, do you think gold will do pretty good? Of course not. For now, gold is holding onto 2000 but it is forming a bear flag pattern which appears to be playing out right now the confirmation would be losing 2000 as support the hour size and negative divergence the macd is curling its way back down into negative momentum i'm not liking gold right now folks that doesn't mean i'm not going to like gold in the long run but i think i'm going to get a better price as an entry here I'm not in a rush if the dollar is moving higher you cannot really stampede and buy gold right now recession or no recession look at what happened to the slv silver the bear flag did play out we got a massive gap down and the declines continue do we have a bottom do we have any sign that the slv is turning around not really so we have to wait and see how 21.57 will hold the support folks be patient here you're gonna get your opportunity in buying gold and silver don't rush we'll look at the daily chart for brent oil what do we see here a bad closing for oil bulls a closing above 77 would have given a lot of relief to oil bulls but this is not looking good is it definitive that it's over for oil of course not that would only happen if we have lower lows if we break this double bottom formation you look at the weekly chart the number is 7140 that's broken it's over it's done which by the way will mean that the recession crowd the recession theme is winning but we do have opic plus meeting this week anything could happen so you have to wait for a break one way or the other. A recapture of 77 bullish, a break below 71.40, run for the hills. Here's the two-year yield daily chart. What do we see here? Consolidating within range, but we got a pop on Friday based on the import price index. And of course, consumer inflation expectations, which means that if we continue to get that kind of slew of data, the Fed is not done. And higher we go. This is once again the icy hot battle. We look at the TLT daily chart. Anything to see here? Not really. Above 100 and three and a half once again it is in negative divergence on the hour side but could it be positive could it be a bullish formation the answer is yes it could if we clean up the chart and we use a line chart instead we have a wedge consolidation pattern but unlike the cues this is actually a bullish wedge consolidation pattern do we have a break the answer is not yet so you don't have to be in a rush be it gold be it silver be it the tlt they are gonna get your opportunity if indeed there is a recession and these indices continue to move higher, you're going to get a better opportunity to buy them. The VIX 4 hours chart, what do we see here? Holding on to 17 by the end of the week and holding on to the positive divergence pattern in the RSI. You look at the MACD, we're getting close here for a breakout, a bullish breakout, which means my expectations are this week the VIX is going to pop. Why would the VIX pop? You got plenty of catalysts. 
We have retail sales. We have a lot of macro data. We have Fed speakers. Of course, we have the looming debt ceiling negotiations. Apple, the big kahuna, 30 minutes chart. What do we see here? It was a down day on Friday, but then we got some short covering by the end. But they did not close above the upper end of the breakdown candle. So we have a potential for more declines to come for Apple. But all in all, the closing was or the trading was within range for the entirety of the week. And therefore, I said last weekend, leave Apple alone for now. And the question is, do we leave it alone still this week? The answer is, let's look at the weekly chart and see what it says. We have a bullish breakout above a sloping line of resistance. It has been retested successfully. The chart is bullish, no doubt about it. But is it getting a little toppy? The answer is yes. Look at the RSI, the MACD, we're getting there. But even if we do, it means a pullback that could take us all the way in another retest of the sloping line of support this time around. This could be, I don't know, Apple going down 160 if you're really lucky. So again, do you want to do that trade and just buy the 160 puts? Make a quick buck if we have a pullback? Maybe. But do you short this chart? Unless you're insane, you're not going to short it. You gotta wait for a break, a failure. For example, if we have a false breakout, the chart breaks this support line, then you get a confirmation of a false breakout, and usually that is followed by a massive sell-off. We're not there yet, folks. Tesla, an hourly chart, what do we see here? We have uh, a mid-finger, followed by another mid-finger, by another one. Every prop fails. The good news for the bulls, it is holding at 167 and a half. But if it continues to fail at every pop over and over and over again, then we don't have buyers. If we don't have buyers, the holders will be frustrated and they're going to sell the chart and push it back all the way to 158.61. And then we take it from there. We look at the weekly chart for Tesla. All what I need you to look at is the MACD indicator. It's not looking good. But do we have a confirmation? The answer is not yet. We could have a confirmation coming this week. If we do, you short Tesla all the way to, let's say, 144.42. Then we'll see what happens. Amazon, four hours chart, what do we see here? Is it really a surprise that the chart stopped exactly at the upper end of the channel? Of course not. Is it really a surprise that it decided to bottom, at least for now, at 109.26? Of course not. The chart, the algos, the market maker is following exactly what I'm showing you here right now. And they're respecting these support lines. Now, if we have a break below 109.26, that would be a bearish catalyst for Amazon. It indicates that the gamma squeeze is over. It indicates that the gap will be closed and then some. If the line is kept as support, then it could be an ABC pattern, a bullish one this time around. How about the KRE, a weekly chart? What do we see here? Oversold, sure, but can it get even more oversold? Yes, because we got 33.48 as support. If we get there, and if we get there rapidly, it would be worth playing a rebound. Does that mean we're going to be out of the woods in the KRE? Not even close. But the chart will become really, really oversold. It will deserve at least a technical rebound, which is worthy of playing. Then I want to show you the chart of Uber, a weekly chart. What? Why am I talking about Uber? Uber is an important indicator. Number one, it is a monopoly. I'm not going to short a monopoly. But if Uber does break out out of this uh, consolidation channel and it closes above 39.24, then we have a positive breakout. And Uber is a leading indicator for the economy. If we have a bullish breakout in the chart, it indicates that the economy is still intact. The consumer is still spending and they're still using Uber. But if it goes down back into the lower end of the channel, despite the fact that it is a monopoly, then what does that say about perhaps one of the strongest names in the economy right now. If it is going down, if business start to slow down, if the investors start to lose hope in Uber, even though it is one of the strongest names, what does that say about the rest of the economy? What does that say about the rest of the stock market? And this is why I'm watching Uber's chart carefully. And lastly, I want to show you some charts for staples that I happen to own, and I talked about positively in this channel, so I know a lot of you own. But I gotta be real with you, these charts are now overextended. They're becoming overbought, which means you gotta hedge. You don't want to sit in losses from wins. You want to lock in your gains. So we look at PIPSICO, for example, a weekly chart. What do we see here? Massive divergence from the trend line. It is a bullish chart. It is still in a bull market look, making higher highs, higher lows. But you look at the RSI, way overbought. So you can buy some puts, let's say the 195, the 190, whatever you're really comfortable with. Buying the put options will be your insurance policy, meaning any losses below 195 or 190, whatever strike you buy, all of these losses will be covered. And it will give you the option by the expiration date of selling your shares at that particular price. Now, usually I buy more than I need. 
let's say I have a thousand shares of PepsiCo. So I'm going to need 10 put contracts to protect my holdings because 10 contracts, each contract has a hundred options, which means 10 contracts cover a hundred, excuse me, a thousand shares of the underlying stock. But I like to go a little more and buy, let's say 20 or 15. That way, if the stock indeed goes down, I can make even more money. I'm covered as a hedge, but I'm also making money as the stock goes down. Another strategy would be a collar strategy, but it limits your gains in case we have more coming for PepsiCo. It means selling a covered call. In this case, you'd sell the 200 for whatever expiration date you want, and then you use the proceeds to buy a put. Let's say the 195 or 190, which means your gains are going to be capped at 200. Your losses are going to be capped at 195 or 190, whatever you choose. The beauty of using a collar strategy is you don't have to pay for the puts because when you sell the covered calls, that will cover the majority of your insurance cost. But it also limits your gains and it forces you to sell if the stock closes above that strike price by the expiration date. Another chart is Mondelez MDLZ weekly chart, massive breakout. We love to see that as Mondelez shareholders but is it overdone the answer is absolutely you look at the hour sites way overbought the risk is it's going to pull back so you got to use either a collar strategy or a put option strategy to lock in your gains last but not least what about bitcoin tulips the daily chart what do we see here negative divergence in the rsi and the macd not looking good right now but it did not break support at twenty six thousand. 555 if it does break that support then we're going to see a flush down all the way let's say 23,000. When we look at the weekly chart for Bitcoin, what do we see here? Negative divergence in the RSI, about to cross to negative momentum in the MACD indicator. So we could see massive losses here to come if the dollar continues to move higher. And we could see a head and shoulder formation in Bitcoin. And if that plays out, we have to zoom out to a monthly chart and we could go down all the way to the support of 17,178. That would be a loss from this point on worth about 35%. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but I'm saying it is a possibility. And by the way, look at the RSI, look at the MACD on Bitcoin. Then look at the MACD and the RSI on the monthly charts of the SPY and the Qs. If Bitcoin is a leading indicator, it is not saying good things. Lastly, moving on to the conclusion of this video, what do we have in the economic calendar this coming week? Monday, May 15th, we have the Empire State Manufacturing Index. And then we have a bunch of Fed zombies speaking from Chicago, Goolsby, and then uh, from Minneapolis, the Demon, Kashkari. And then on Tuesday, May 16th, we have plenty of things. We have retail sales. That's the most important reading. And then we have... Um, industrial production, capacity utilization, and the Home Builders Confidence Index. And then plenty of Fed zombies from Cleveland, Mr., from Richmond, Barkin, from New York, Williams, and again from Chicago, Goolsby, and then from Atlanta, Boystick, inside a trader, Boystick. And of course, in addition to Vice uh, Chair Barr, who blamed the collapse of SVB on mismanagement, now he might blame it on shorts. You watch. Wednesday, the 17th, we have housing starts and building permits. Thursday, the 18th, we have the Philly Factory Survey, along with initial jobless claims, existing home sales, and leading economic indicators. And of course, we have more Fed zombies, this time around Governor Jefferson, who's going to be vice chair, by the way, and once again, vice chair Barr. On Friday, May 19th, we have Williams from New York, once again, along with the big dog. Powell and the former big dog Bernanke. It's a tag team of idiocy. Both of them screwed up. Bernanke, he, he, he panicked in 2013 after the taper tantrum. That was one of the biggest mistakes in Fed history. And of course, Powell with his weakness, the cave in 2018, massive mistake. And of course, transitory. And now God knows what. Is he going to capitulate prematurely, allow inflation to come back? Or is he going to double down and crack the economy wide open. We'll see what happens. But folks, once again, hope you enjoyed the weekend. Happy Mother's Day. But for now, this is all I got for you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Love you all. And I will talk to you again tomorrow. Good night.